All right. Um, so the reading for next time, um, you're just reading uh, the Chinua Achebe essay, uh, African Literature as Restoration of Celebration. And if you still have words you have to submit for points, then submit three words. Um, but uh, yeah, again, like, again, like if you've hit 10 points, you don't have to keep doing that. Yeah, I gave up on it. I was like, mm. <laughs> sorry. But yes, but yeah, 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 you know. Um, well, I, 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 think, I think you got the point. <laughs> um, so yeah, Achebe is uh, what was uh, the, probably about the best known living African no novelist. He's uh, from Nigeria. Um, and for a while, whenever I was teaching living writers um, in my classes, um, a semester after I started teaching them, they would die. Um, and Chinua Achebe was kind of the first in that, um, in that little group. So I was kind of wondering for a little while, I was like, is it me? Is it something I'm doing? <laughs> am, I, am I killing off all of these literary giants somehow? <laughs> okay. all right, so do you guys have any questions about anything before we get started? Oh, one of, are you still going to give us like what we need to do for our uh, paper two? Yes, um, I will get that to you um, over the weekend. Um, I'll send you an assignment sheet, and then we can talk about it on Tuesday. Okay. I remember you mentioned you were going to give it to us, like print it out, and yeah. I completely forgot about it until just now. Yeah, and I, I've, just, I, I've been um, a little bit more frazzled uh, this week than I usually am, so I just haven't, I just haven't been able to pull it together. But um, yeah, when I, get to my, when I get back to my office after class, I will pull it together, I will email it to you. You can look it over. You can email me any questions you have. Um, I will be out of town this weekend, um, but um, I will still be checking email. So you know, I may not get back to you as quickly, but I will still get back to you. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. Though. I mean, I understand mm -hmm. the process. Like sometimes, like exam week, okay. I'm just like yeah. out of it. I'm just like, what am I even supposed to be doing? Well, w welcome to adult life. <laughs> Most of your life from this point will be wondering what you're supposed to be doing. <laughs> yeah, well, when people ask that, like, some random people in my store mm -hmm. be like, what is, what, does anyone understand this life thing? And I'm going to swipe up so bad and be like, nobody knows what we're supposed to do. You yep. just <laughs> there and see how you do. And it's supposed to be right and it's supposed to be wrong. Yeah. Now, I want you to cons like I want to start today by having you consider this particular question, and think about it carefully. Like unlike the meaning of life, this is something you can't answer. Right? <laughs> but I want you to yeah, think very carefully about this, right? About what we mean exactly by language. And then whenever you have a ready response, go ahead and go ahead and speak up.
okay if I go ahead and speak mm -hmm. while you're working? Okay. So, I was kind of a smart ass when I first was thinking about this. Okay. You know, I speak English and a little bit of Spanish from high school, but I think more okay. of like the in-depth version of that would be probably like, um, like Christianity to an okay. extent, like with like biblical terminology, like Bible verses and stuff like that. Okay. Like only stuff that like certain Christians would understand as well as anybody, anybody else. Maybe. Okay. I don't know. I'm trying to think more on that, but like. No, I think you're, you're thinking along the right lines here, right? Um, yeah, um, you know, there's probably stuff that, you know, from your religious tradition, right? That if you started, st you know, talking that at me, I would have no idea what you were talking about, right? Well, because I'm, you know, not of the same tradition, right? Yeah. And then also, due to my major, I'm familiar with medical terminology. Okay. Like, myo means muscle. Sure. You know? So, in all, I know about three languages. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Yeah, good. Yeah, I was like, when you put that, I was like, I only know how to speak English. But, mm -hmm. you know, I was like, well, I think there's a deeper meaning to what you're sure. speaking. So I just was thinking back to life. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you're, 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 you're thinking in the right direction here. You're thinking along the right lines. Uh, Rylan, are you ready or are you, uh, you need a little time? If you need a minute, that's fine. I just, I could not think of anything no, else around. So <laughs> sure. This will probably be like way better. Like I have a feeling it's gonna be good. But, you know, like, I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's let's think about like these. Let's think about this first uh, selection here as well, right? Do you only speak one form of English? Probably not. Because, I mean, there's like, I don't know. Well, it's like English is like, okay, I've heard it's like a hard language because mm -hmm. there's so many different, like, ways to say stuff. Sure. Like synonyms and stuff like, even uh -huh. though we don't believe in synonyms. <laughs> there's no such thing as a true synonym. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I'm glad like, you remember that. Yes. But it's like, um, oh, I was trying to talk, talk to my dad about that, and he's like, that doesn't make sense, and I'm like, it still makes sense to me, so. Yeah, well, the, the, the re well, and again, like, the, the reason I say that, though, is that, like, if we have, a, like, we don't use, let me, let me back up here for a second, though. <laughs> so we, we don't keep words in the language that we don't need for something, right? So even though two words might refer to, say, the same object, there are different shades of meaning attached to each word that would mean that you would use them in different contexts, right? Yeah. So you, there are very few words in English or in any language that you can just use completely interchangeably. And I feel like with the English that I was kind of referring to, would mm -hmm. be like, you know, me, I grew up in the South. So okay. like, there's like southern terms that I could say that someone from the, wait, you're from, the, where are you from? I am from, I'm from northeast Pennsylvania. Yeah. yeah, Pennsylvania. You wouldn't understand. No. Or like mm -hmm. if certain words would be like ghetto or something like that. Like that's just kind of, I don't even understand why people say that, but still. But it's like, you know, talking about that, like, oh, that sounds ghetto, why would you say that? Right, but yeah, but, but again, so, so we're talking about particular regional dialects here, right? Right. Okay. So do you, um, you still, still working at it? Oh, uh, yeah, I'm about to finish that. So. <laughs> okay, no worries. But yeah, so yeah, so there, there's the standard English, right, that you speak in school and in professional situations. And yeah, and then there is also, yeah, specific regional dialect. Or maybe like stereotypical English, like, you know, like, could that be a thing? Let's sit on that for a minute and see where we end up here once. <laughs> yeah, you know, I just made myself stop. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Um, okay. Um, so I said at the first glance at the question, I thought it was a sarcastic answer. <laughs> superficial awareness. 
However, I want uh -huh. that I speak more than just the language that I'm writing this response in. Uh -huh. There is a language I speak when I'm amongst my closest friends that tends to be a more loose version of English. Then okay. there's the way I refine my English when I'm around those who demand respect for me. And that's why I stop myself. Okay. So yeah, you, you're, you're talking here about two different versions of English that you speak, right? That you switch back and forth between, depending on who you're talking to. Yeah, a standard English and kind of the well, like kind of slang English, right? You know, um, in which like some terms even from standard English might be repurposed and given different definitions, right? Um, now, my list here, like I am ashamed to admit that despite efforts in high school and college to learn German um, and you know efforts in graduate school to learn French that I am basically an English monoglot, right? I don't really speak any non-English languages. However, within English, right, within this broader category, right, I spend most of my life and my time speaking standard English mostly for professional reasons by the nature of what I do for a living. I have also retained a little bit of the Northeast Pennsylvania English that I grew up speaking. So for example, like um, if I was to offer you a sandwich, and I'm not going to do so because I don't have the ingredients, um, that is, uh, it's meat and cheese with lettuce and tomato and some kind of dressing on a long roll. What would you call that sandwich? A sub. Okay, yeah, and in, in most of the country, that's a sub, right? In Northeast Pennsylvania, for reasons that are not entirely clear, that sandwich is called a hoagie. Okay, that makes yeah. sense. I mean, I've had hoagies, but I like that. I think being yeah, <laughs> yeah, it was even from Philadelphia, yeah, yeah. So yeah, this is a kind of specifically like Eastern Pennsylvania, New Jersey term, right? Um, there's a phrase that people use uh, where I come from. Um, so like if I point outside to the weather and I say, it's gloomy outside, hang or no. What part of that sentence did you understand? The gloomy outside. It's gloomy outside, yeah. And then I and said, the no part. yeah, Haina or no is this bizarre expression that working class people in particular use in Northeast PA. Um, it means something like, do you agree with me? I'm not sure, again, what the origins of that are. It's probably, it's probably from, derived from Polish in some way. And I'm not going to write it on the board because I have no idea how to spell it. <laughs> but it's one of those things that doesn't usually get written out, right? It's just solely in people's uh, spoken dialect. Um, like in Southern, where we say, bless your heart. Yeah. And that's like a nice way of saying someone's stupid. <laughs> what, what the word ain't? Ain't. ain't. Yeah. yeah, I, I like say that. Child, like, yeah. Now there's a way to spell it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> my mama gets on to me and like, she's mm -hmm. like, ain't, and I was like, Ain't, and she's like, it's aren't, and I was like, hey, we're not going to Yeah, and, well, and, and I think, like, what's, ain't was a working class way of pronouncing aren't, right? Yeah. So, making ain't, quote unquote, not a word, mm -hmm. um, was basically a way of denigrating um, somebody's class origins and the way, and the, the way they were evident, the way they spoke, right? Um, yeah, this comes actually from working class 19th century English, right? Um, That's a word. <laughs> yeah, it, 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 yeah, well, and here's the thing. If you say it and another speaker of your particular language or dialect understands what it means, right, it's a word. Uh, I think that's what a lot of people don't understand about grammar, too, right? A grammatical sentence is a sentence that another speaker of your language can decode correctly, right? That's all grammatical actually means. But in addition to you know, the standard English, the Northeast Pennsylvania English um, that I grew up with, right, I also do have a professional jargon that I'm familiar with. Right? There's a certain set of terms that 
literary scholars use um, both sort of in discourse with each other and in publications and things like that, right, that are a little opaque to people who haven't been educated in that particular field, right? And this is true of just about any field. So you have, you have uh, mentioned, you know, the nursing stuff, the medical terminology, and you're familiar with. You're a biology major, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah, so yeah, um, you would uh, probably have a similar uh, professional job, right? Mm -hmm. Right, things that wouldn't really make sense to people outside of your particular field. Um, so the point that I'm trying to make here um, is one that's closely related to Anzaldua's, right? That our linguistic identities are actually really complicated. And that what we think of as being a single specific language um, is subject to a wide variety of regional, socioeconomic, and cultural variation, right? So it might help if we think today as we're going through Anzaldua's stuff about that idea we discussed, we talked about Audre Lorde, um, intersectionality. Does anybody remember what intersectionality was, what this means, if we're talking about identity? Exactly. Okay. Like, uh, <laughs> it's just like, I guess, really like the word intersection. I guess not being. What were we talking about? Well, I think we were talking about like, at the crossroads, like being. Yeah, like, it's like not your personality, yeah. but it's like you on the inside. It's like your different individual, like, yeah. personality. Uh -huh. Like how she, how um, she used it with, like, with her being lesbian, with her being a mother, with her being a yes. um, scholar and stuff. Like yeah. All of that was a part of your intersectionality. Yeah. Intersectionality. Intersectionality, yes. Yeah, I, 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 I said it wrong. Yes. I, was, I was like, crap. <laughs> yes, yes. yes, intersectionality, right? Yeah, the, the basic theory is that identity is constructed through the interaction. of its various component parts in our lives, right? So we all belong to more than one category, right? And we can think of identity in terms of race, in terms of gender, in terms of language, in terms of socioeconomic class, right, profession, age, right, regional identity, and right, this isn't even an exhaustive list, right, this is just the tip of the iceberg. But the basic point here is, right, that our identities are formed not by any single one of these things, but by the interaction of all of them, right? So it, it's not necessarily helpful to think of ourselves as you know, a member of one single category here. Right? We have to consider, when we're talking about ourselves or anyone else, the variety of different categories that they belong to and how that has shaped their life experience, right? So for example, you know, someone who is white, wealthy, English speaking, and um, <clears throat> disabled still has a different experience of the world, right? Than someone who is white, wealthy, English speaking, and not disabled, right? Now, the other thing I want us to think about here is the way a culture constitute, constructs what constitutes knowledge, right? So we talked here a little bit about language and identity. I want to talk here, like, again, like, specifically because Anzaldua uh, had a PhD in English, um, worked as a high school English teacher, as an English professor, um, about what constitutes valid knowledge within 
the field of English, right? What sorts of texts in particular people are expected to read and to master? So there's, there's this idea in literature as a field called the canon. And the canon is the set of texts and or authors that a person working within the field is expected to be familiar with, in particular to have mastered, right? So I want you guys to take a couple of, set of, of um, take a couple of minutes and think about who you would assume would be in the canon of English and or American literature. Like, what authors do you think, not just ones you think are good, but ones that you think are important, right? Even if you don't like them. <laughs> think, think the kinds of writers that you were asked to read in school for the most part, right? <laughs> it doesn't have to be exhaustive. Just uh, pick, pick, a, pick, a couple of, pick a couple of the biggies. Could they be poets too? Absolutely. Okay. Good. Yeah. Poets, playwrights, essayists, fiction writers, whatever. If you have been taught that they are an important writer, put them on your list. What have you got? Have you got a couple of names? I had a couple of others. Okay. I feel like I got some of them that you said. So isn't there one um, named Charles Dickens? There is a Charles Dickens, yes. Okay. And then Edgar Allan Poe, Shakespeare. Okay. And I believe Martin Luther King. Wasn't he a writer too? Absolutely. I mean, we read something he wrote, right? <laughs> yes. Yeah, I feel like a lot of his pieces we've learned, I've learned about their high school. Okay. I heard Ernest Hemingway. Iron Man, Maya Angelou, Sylvia Plath, and Lexi Hughes. Okay, Plath, Hughes, and there was, right, Maya Angelou. Getting there. Okay. So, this, this, is, a, this is a more, a more diverse group of writers than I usually get from students. Look at us. Yeah, usually when I usually when I get this, and again, like I think you know, this is just kind of a function of our educational system and what it tends to value, right? Usually the list I get um, is a lot more white and a lot more male. You've included more women and more people of color on the list than is typical, right? Although it's, it looks as though the the list is still mostly dead white and male. I couldn't think of any of the female writers that like because uh -huh. I know we've gone. There was one named Emily, but I couldn't remember her name. It was Emily something. Was it Dickens too? Dickens, Dickens, son. Dickens son. That was, <laughs> see, I thought it was Dickens, and I was like, uh -huh. Charles Dickens. You're tripping yourself up on Charles yes. Dickens there. Yeah, that's, that's what's happening. Yeah. But you know, so, <laughs> essentially, like, the, the, there is one thing that all of these writers certainly do have in common, though. And I think that this relates to something that, to a point that Anzaldua is making in her essay, right? So these are all English or American writers, right? 
And what language do all of them write in? English. They all write in English, yes. <laughs> now, here's why I think this is important to understanding Anzaldua's uh, basic argument here. I want to turn to page 41, where she's talking about her experiences as a high school English teacher. Now, can somebody start reading for us uh, the paragraph at the bottom that starts in the 1960s? Uh, page 41. In the 1960s, I read my first Chicana. Uh, Chicana. Um, so actually, let's, let's pause here a second. <laughs> she uses these terms a lot. Does anybody know what Chicano Chicana mean? I thought it was Chicago for a second, and then I was like, wait a minute. No. Definitely not. <laughs> is it another word for Is it Spanish? Like, is it Spanish for Chicano? Because A and O is female and male. Yeah, so I think you're think yeah, you're both thinking along the right lines here, yeah. Um, so Chicano, Chicana, is a term that refers to a specific uh, Mexican-American cultural identity. Um, people on either side of the border. And it's specifically a working class Mexican-American identity that is um, of mixed European and indigenous American descent. In fact, the term Chicano, um, the etymology of it is disputed, uh, but it's probably a contraction of Mexicano with the first syllable taken off, right? So up until the 1960s, this was usually used as a slur to describe um, working class Mexican Americans who were not um, assimilating into white American culture. So as a slur, you mean it was like a bad word, like you wouldn't? Yeah, it, it, it was. It, yeah, it, it was. It was something that was considered offensive to call someone, right? Oh. Okay. Yeah, it, it was. Yeah, something you called someone if you wanted to insult them. That was my child's was mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, but by the 1960s. Um, Chicano starts to um, emerge as a specific cultural identity when people um, of this particular group start claiming the, the term for themselves and um, making the case for their own uh, separate cultural heritage, right? So it's not the same thing as Latino or Hispanic, right? Hispanic is purely a term used by the US government to describe any person in the United States who comes from a Spanish-speaking background. Yeah, they, I looked at the census. It's a box, yeah. Yeah, I looked at the census uh -huh. form and they did like Latina and Latina, that would be more in the race, and then Hispanic would be in the. Um, yeah, there's area. yeah, what white white non-Hispanic, right? Yeah, yeah, that's, the, yeah. Mm -hmm. and it's really ridiculous. Yeah, we ain't gonna go into that. Now, Latino or Latina refers specifically to people of Latin American origin, regardless of their actual um, country of origin, right, or country of cultural heritage. So, for example, like, you know, there are big cultural differences, you know, say, between Cuban Americans and Puerto Rican Americans um, in voting patterns, in cultural habits, um, in all sorts of things, right? So I remember, um, you know, after the 2020 election, reading all of these um, analyses of the Latino vote, right, where these white political science, scientists and demographers we're basically kind of looking at the Latino vote as a block, right? 
and they were surprised how many Latinos had voted for Trump without taking into account that certain groups that identify as Latino, like, for example, Cuban Americans in Florida, have voted Republican for a really long time. Right? <clears throat> so expecting you know, all of these groups to conform to the same basic cultural and political patterns, right? Um, suggest that you're trying to flatten out differences there, right? Rather than understand what those differences are. And then Chicano is the, then a more specific identity within this larger blanket identity, right? So what she is arguing for is the separateness of Chicano, Chicana as an identity with its own linguistic and cultural heritage. Now, where was I going with this? Right, we're talking about. <laughs> I feel like I, I feel like it went, I th this was a useful tangent. But I feel like, uh, yeah. It, okay, I, I got slightly fine. sidetracked. Okay. okay. So can uh, can you start up with, from in the 1960s again? Okay. In the 1960s, I read my first Chicano novel. It was City of Night by Rob. Oops. John Ritchie. John, yeah, my bad. John Ritchie. Okay. A gay Texas. Texan, mm -hmm. son of a Scottish father and a Mexican mother. For days, for days I walk around, walked around in stunned amazement of, that a Chicano could write and could be published. When I read, I am Joe, Joe Queen. Uh, uh, Joaquin. Joaquin, sorry. Mm -hmm. I was surprised to be to see a bilingual book by a Chicano in print. When I saw poetry written in text mix for the first time, a feeling of joy flashed through me. I felt like we were really excited as a people. Okay, so pause there for a second, right? So what's the importance to her of seeing all of this Chicano literature being published? What does this suggest to her? There's gonna be more diversity in books and not just old white men writing books. Okay, yeah, on the one, yeah, on the one hand, yeah, it's, yeah, it's, you know, publish, the publishing industry selecting things to put into print that are not the same old dead white guy stuff, right? Yeah. Representation. Yeah, representation, and in particular, representation of her particular cultural identity, right? Because we're being, you know, I, I have to stop. I, I keep saying we because I'm trying to think from the author's perspective, and I really shouldn't do that, so I'm... Yeah, uh, try to police me on that. Um, what do you want to be like? Don't do that. Don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> Stop it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> because, you know, you know, for various reasons, right, I can't inhabit her perspective, right? I haven't lived the kind of life that she has. Um, but, yeah, so what she's, you know, what she's saying is like her people now have fully arrived, right? They're culturally recognized. Their stuff is in print. It's been given, thus, the seal of approval of the official culture. Right, so, woohoo, moving on up, right? Yeah, go ahead. You know, I was about to say moving on up, but I was hoping <laughs> you would catch the reference. Mm -hmm. It's from this old 70s. I remember the, the, the Jeffersons. Jeffersons. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> yep. I remember the Jeffersons. It is so They started off as uh, side characters on All in the Family. They were, they were Archie, Bunker, yeah. Archie mm -hmm. Bunker's next door neighbors, yeah. And then they went off and did their yep. own show. They won, the, they won the lottery, yep, and they, yes. they got their own show. They, they won the lottery? Yeah, that was how they, how they moved up to the east side, how, how they were able to move on up to the east side from Queens, where they, where they I were. I did not know that side. They were from Harlem, I thought. No, they, 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 lived, they lived in Queens, right next, to, right next to Archie Bunker. Good old, you know, good old Irish racist working class like <laughs> Archie Bunker. Oh, okay. But yeah, okay, so in order to avoid, like, this further tangent into 1970 sitcoms. <laughs> Rylan, can you continue so reading sorry. for us in, in 1971? Okay. In 1971, when I started teaching high school English to Chicano students, I tried to supplement the required text with works by Chicano, only to be recommended and forbidden to do so by the principal. He claimed that I was supposed to teach American and English literature. At the risk of being fired, I swore my students to secrecy and slipped in Chicano short stories, poems, a play. In, grad, in graduate school, while working toward a PhD, I had to argue with one advisor after the other, semester after semester, before I was allowed to make Japan literature an area of focus. Okay, thank you. So let's start 
with the fight she has with her school principal over these texts that she wants to teach, right? She almost got fired for it. Yeah. What is, what, 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 what's, what's the problem here? What's the argument? Um, the principal has the argument that what she's teaching is an American. Yeah, exactly, right? The argument here is over the definition of, American of what is and is not American, right? I don't think it's a definition. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, what I, but the principal definitely has a definition, right? Yeah. And does his definition include someone like John Retchie? No. Yeah, I mean, where, you know, where, where, where does she tell us John Retchie is from? He's from, I think, Mexico is where she said. Texas. Yeah, he's Texas. from he's from Texas, he's right? He's a gay Texan, so it yeah. could be also be because of that too. Mm -hmm. Sure. During the time period. Sure. But if you're just talking about strictly like if his argument is that you should be teaching American literature, right? He's from Texas. He's Dude's from, from Texas. Texas, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so regardless of whether he's writing in a Chicano dialect, um, you know, regardless of what his parentage is or his sexuality, right? You know, he's an American. So, the print, so what she's pointing out here is that the definition of American that has been institutionalized is an unnecessarily narrow one that only really kind of encompasses a certain kind of person or right, a certain kind of identity, right? So we can relate this to her childhood experience in school if you go back to page 36, can you get one of you to read the paragraph that starts, I remember being caught speaking Spanish at recess. Um, I remember being caught speaking Spanish at recess. That was good for three licks on the knuckle with a sharp woman. I remember being sent to the corner of the classroom for talking back to the Anglo teacher when I was trying to do, when all I was trying to do was tell her how to pronounce my name. If you want to be American, speak American. If you don't like it, go back to Mexico where you belong. So, what yeah, page this, this is page 36. Oh, you didn't say that. I did, didn't I? I didn't hear it. <laughs> I, I must have been drunk out, my bad. <laughs> you know, we keep going to stop. Uh, no, uh, we'll, we'll pause here, right? And let's just try to take this paragraph apart, right? So she's still talking here about, she's talking here less about literature and more specifically about language, right? But what do we notice here about um, language in the paragraph, right? What, what are, the, what are the consequences and rewards associated with language? She has to speak English. Yeah, the expectation, well, is it that she has to speak English? What's she told she has to speak? American. American. Yeah, the teacher says, speak American. It's okay. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I know. I agree. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, like, if, if the whole story wasn't so horrifying, I'd be rolling my eyes too, right? <laughs> but, yeah, but yeah, the, the equation here is of American with not just English, but with standard English, right? Whenever she says licks, does that mean she's getting, like, hit with a ruler on her knuckles? Exactly, yeah, because uh, Amzaldua grew up in an age in which corporal punishment was still permitted in public schools. <laughs> you were still, they, they were still allowed to hit kids. Um, and I'm always a little bit baffled by, it seems like it's always people who grew up under that regime who think married. we should be allowed to go back to it. <laughs> it's like, you, you got smacked around. <laughs> do, you, you, do you want that to happen to your grandkids? But, well. I still at my, at my middle school, um, mm -hmm. I, Paddling right in front of us. Yeah. 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 I think that there, yeah. there, are some, there are some states where it's still legal. Uh, mostly, um, mostly fairly conservative states. Yeah, where, where, where limited forms of corporal punishment are still permitted. Yeah. Um, I mean, you know, where where I grew up in Pennsylvania it was like it, it was kind of long gone by the time I was in school. I think it's like from the idea of community parenting. Uh huh. Everybody has the right to smack everybody else and somebody else's Yeah, like, mom would be like, if she's acting to smack her, these people Well, it, it, it takes a village, right? Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, so the, the idea, so there are a couple of ideas here that I think we can connect 
two languages, right? One that American is equated with English, right? And in particular with a, with a form of English. Um, and also a kind of lack of belonging here, right? She's told that America isn't where she belongs, even though she's born and raised in Texas, right? right? Like John Retchie, she is a native Texan. Um, but <clears throat> because of her linguistic and cultural difference, she is told that she doesn't belong, right? She can be punished um, for speaking Spanish or even for something as simple as telling the teacher how to pronounce her name, right? Um, so, are either of you familiar with the concept of microaggression? Yeah, it's like your, it's your minimal, yeah, minimalizing you probably, yeah. somebody's um, culture, I believe is what it is. Yeah, and microaggressions are often, um, often unintentional. Yeah. Um, they're like, but they, there are ways that people display a kind of lack of sensitivity um, towards um, particularly minority cultures, right? So um, it's like, you know, if, when a white person walks up to a black person and asks, oh, can I touch your hair, right? Yeah, like they may not mean to be, they may not mean to, yeah, they may not mean to be offensive, but the assumption that you should be allowed to do that is offensive, right? Or like going up to pregnant women and touching their belly. Well, that, that, yeah, that, I guess that would also, be, I mean, that, that's also kind of like an invasion of barriers, but it's not quite the same thing. Microaggressions usually have a racial and cultural dimension uh, to them. Um, or like, for example, um, you know, if you, you know, refuse to, if, if you just continually refuse to pronounce someone's name correctly, mm -hmm. even after being corrected, right, which is kind of specifically what's happening here, right? She's telling the teacher how to pronounce her name. And the teacher is actually committing more than a microaggression. Is actually committing a, a, an aggression. So he's just being straight up racist. Yeah, and telling her to, yes, to sit down and shut up. Yeah. Or go back but, to Mexico. Yeah, Mexico. yeah. Whereas if, if what the teacher did was simply to continually mispronounce the name, that would be a microaggression, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, give you an example of this. Like the just before I abandoned Facebook for good, um, I got into a, I got into an argument with a guy I went to high school with, um, David Perdue, who was then the, sen the, the, the senior senator from Georgia, was going around uh, campaigning uh, for re-election, and he was talking about Kamala Harris, and he was kind of intentionally fumbling over her name <laughs> in front of predominantly white audiences, and then laughing about it and saying whatever. And this high school friend, whom I hadn't talked to since we were 18 years old, but still felt like it was his right to offer opinions on, on my page, um, said that, you know, you know, why is the left always so, always so quick to call somebody racist? I said, well, like, dude, like, this is racist. Right? <laughs> this is, you know, someone he works with, he should know how to pronounce her name, and he is intentionally mispronouncing it to get a rise out of a white audience, right? That is, again, it's like, like it's, if it's a microaggression, it's a pretty big one. It, you know, it, 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 given the intentionality of it, it actually probably approaches simple aggression, right? But yeah, the more, in, the more unintentional uh, slip-ups like that people make, those are, are what we, those are usually what we mean by microaggressions. See, pronouncing names, like, it takes me a while to pronounce your name, mm -hmm. so I don't even mean to. It's just, like, it sure. takes a minute to register how to pronounce Sure. It, uh, 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 absolutely. And I, like, I think, like, 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 generally people are willing to give, give others credit if they're trying in good faith, right? It's the not trying thing, I think, that is probably the biggest. Okay, because I was issue. like, am it's I doing the, this? Yeah. That pron mm -hmm. I mispronounce a lot of words. Names yeah. included. So. Yeah. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Yeah, <laughs> but you know, and, and I think you know, the, you know, the, the 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 fact of like like acknowledging it and wanting to do better is a big step, right? You know, that's. But yeah, this teacher the, the, again back to the point where this teacher clearly doesn't want to do better, right? The teacher wants her to conform to this particular notion of what it means to be an American, and will punish her if she doesn't. And then can we uh, look at the following paragraph here? Because this is kind of this is all moving along the same lines, right? Can somebody continue with, I want you to speak English? Okay, we'll try this. 
Do I have to say the Spanish part? No, in fact, I will simply read for you what the translation is. Thank you. Okay. I want you to speak English. To find a good job, you have to understand English well. What good is your education if you speak English with an accent? My mother would say, mortified that I spoke English like a Mexican. At, a, at Pan American University, I and all China, Chicano. Chicano, thank you. Mm -hmm. Students were required to have two, to take two speech classes. Their purpose to get rid of our accent. Okay, thank you. So when she's attending college, right, who are the only people at this university who are required to take these speech classes? The Chicano. Yeah. Chicano. Only the Chicano students have to take these speech classes. And the implication here is that these are not like public speaking courses like you can take here at GSW, right? Mm -hmm. That these are more like elocution lessons where you're taught to speak a particular way. The idea being to strip you of your accent, right? So, yeah, this notion of being an American requires one not only to speak English, but to speak it in the approved way without an accent. And what does it even mean to speak without an accent? Does anybody not have an accent? <laughs> I don't have an accent. <laughs> yeah, everybody has an accent, right? Now, we don't always speak with the accent that, we're, that we grow up with, right? Um, like I don't speak like a Northeast Pennsylvania person anymore because I haven't lived there um, since I was 18. What I speak now, like, you know, like I think people can usually tell when they talk to me that I'm from somewhere in the mid-Atlantic but can't always place me exactly where, like people will say New York or New Jersey or maybe Philadelphia. But yeah, people rarely specifically place me in Northeast PA um, because my accent has become a little bit more flattened out and generalized. Um, but they know even I'm from the South. What's so that? They know I'm from the sure. South. They don't know where, but uh -huh. they assume. And I'm like, yeah, stop doing it. Yeah, but you know, the, the thing is here, though, right, that the, re like, the reason my accent reads is standard English has to do with the cultural prestige of cer certain regions of the country, right? That certain regions of the country have dominated media and culture for a long time. And because of that, certain ways of speaking English, certain sounds of English are more valued than others, right? Will get you farther than others. And that's what the mother is talking about here too. It's like, if you speak English with, an ac with a Mexican accent, you're not going to be able to get a good job. So the whole idea here is to be able to please these authority figures, right? To please the principal with the narrow definition of American literature, to please the teacher who's telling her to speak American, and then to please the, the HR person who is interviewing you for a job at some point in your future, right? All, right, all of these authority figures want you to speak standard English. And if we look at the very beginning of this, right, just above this account of her childhood education, uh, Rachel, can you read for us, um, starting from we're going to have to control your tongue. There's a metaphor here that I think is important uh, to understanding what's going on. Okay, will you just tell me when to stop? Or? Yeah, I'll just tell you when to stop. Okay. We're going to have to control your tongue, but then it says pulling out all the metal from my mouth. Mm -hmm. Silver bit, bit clocks and uh -huh. Okay. In the basin. My mouth is a mother load. The dentist is cleaning out my roots. I get a whip of the sense, then gasp. I can't cap the tooth yet, you're still draining, he says. We're going to have to do something about your tongue. I hear the anger rising in his voice. My tongue keeps pushing out the wads of cotton, push, pushing back the drills. Um, Wait, the drills, mm -hmm. the long, thin needle. I nev I've never seen anybody as strong or as stubborn, he says. 
And I think, I think how do you tame the, the tongue? To train to be train it to be quiet, or do the brittle and silent? How do you how do you make it lie down? Okay, so the first overarching metaphor here. I don't right? need to stumble on that. Yeah, it happens. So, what's the situation she's setting up here? What's happening in this little story? I think she's getting a root canal. Yeah. She's getting like a, or she's getting a filling, wouldn't she be? Well, she's getting her fillings taken out, her roots cleaned, and then it looks like the dentist is going to cap her teeth, right? Yeah. So... She's sitting in a dentist's chair, and all of these things are happening. Filling uh, distracted, um, leaves cleaned, and teeth capped. Wait, you guys think it's a villain with extracted? Well, I think, yeah, for the, you know, I think in order, if you're getting a tooth capped, yes, you do. Um, they have to take the, essentially they have to take everything out of the existing tooth and clean it before they can put the cap down on. Oh, I have a lot of fillings, that's why. <laughs> <laughs> well, as long as you never need a cap, then you're probably good there, right? Yeah. But think about what the, what's the experience of being in a dentist's chair like? It's, oof, you're just like laying there with your mouth open and they just be like, open your mouth wider or... Uh -huh. And you feel the drill or the yeah. water and all that, and you're just like, can we be done? Yeah. Yeah, for, for most of us, it's not a pleasant experience, right? Because no. you're sitting helpless in a chair while somebody is sticking sharp things in your mouth. I was right? going to say, as control freak, I feel like I lose control. You know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the dentist has all the control in the situation, right? Yeah. So the dentist here is the authority figure, right? And he's pulling fillings, which she describes as little bits of silver, out of her teeth, flushing out her roots, and he's going to cap her teeth. Right now, does everybody know what it means to get your teeth capped? That metal, like, yeah, the metal thing? Um, doesn't have to be that essentially what happens when you're getting your teeth capped is um, the uh, existing tooth, the natural tooth, um, gets kind of like filed down uh, and it's replaced with an artificial covering, right? So the natural, so the natural tooth gets covered up with a cap. They file your tooth down? Well, I'm sure that they, they, a good a good or reputable dentist will give you lots of anesthetic before doing that. Okay. But I think yeah, they have to shrink its size down before they can put the cap on, right? She seems pretty like alert though for like having like her. Okay. Teeth. Well, what what makes her seem so alert? She's over here describing everything that's going on. Sure. Like she's, she's remembering what control. he's saying, like mm -hmm. his his words, like we need to control that tongue. Yeah. Or like remembering the smell of the stench, you mm -hmm. know, like stuff yeah. like that. Well, a local anesthetic is usually what they would get where they, essentially they just numb your mouth. Yeah. You're still awake. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so the teeth, so she's getting artificial coverings on her natural teeth. And in order to do that, he has to take something away from her. Right, the silver to be found in her mouth. But what is he completely unable to control here? Right, so he's a, he's angry because he's not in complete control of the situation. Right, her what tongue. he can't get her tongue under control. Right, I think what we need to think about here is what the tongue is a metaphor for. What is a tongue traditionally a symbol or a metaphor for? Speaking. Yeah. 
speech and language, right? And what's being set up here is a series of situations in which people have tried to control her linguistic expression, right? And have tried to make her conform to a particular linguistic standard. Now she talks about standard English and standard Spanish, right? What does it mean when something's like, when we talk about standard English, for example, what do we mean by that? What does standard mean? Something that everyone knows. Like, it's like, I guess, like, the correct way to say something. Okay, correct. And I think you were also hitting on the idea that it's somehow universal, right? Yeah, that was the word I was thinking of. I just couldn't say it. Okay. I think everyone can identify to that. Like, someone is speaking in standard English, we all can be able to understand what they're saying. Yeah. And yet, we, you know, we talk about standard English as though this is kind of like, like the universal English, right? But, yeah, it is. It's completely artificial, right? It's not anyone's natural language. Right? Like the tooth cat. Hardly anyone speaks, you know, standard English, or you know, if you were in England, the Queen's English, right? At home, most people speak. You know, you know she refers to um, what is uh, North Mexican uh, Spanish dialect, Chicano Spanish, and Tex-Mex as her home languages, right? Now, when she's listing her the, the languages she speaks on page thirty-eight, right? She is listing them in the order of, prestige, of perceived social prestige, right? With standard English and slang English at the top, and then standard Spanish, and so on and so forth, with this um, youth language uh, <clears throat> common among Chicano youth um, at the bottom, right? So standard refers really not so much to the amount in which, like, to the universal use of a particular language, but to the esteem in which it's held, right? Wait, what do you mean by esteem? Basically, like how it's uh, how it's regarded socially. Okay, because when I think of esteem, I think of low and high self-esteem. Okay, yeah, so self-esteem so, so yeah, self is, is self-regard, right? Mm -hmm. So how you esteem something is how you regard something. Okay. What, what? Like society's regard. Yeah, oh, yeah. Okay, I see what you're saying. Yeah. So what she's saying is that someone will regard someone who speaks standard English more highly than someone who speaks working class English, whom they'll still regard more highly than someone who speaks standard Spanish, right? So on and so forth. Okay, everybody with me, making sense. You're yawning, but, but you're still here? I'm sorry. It's okay. Yeah. <laughs> I thought you were tired. Like, yeah. I woke up exhausted today. Uh-huh. Like, well, I mean, it's just, it, it's, it's, that, it's that kind of weather, yeah. I, I always feel sleepy on days like this, too. I feel like I need more coffee. Yeah, you probably do. Yeah, I have a writing assignment. Don't we all? Don't, don't we all need a little more coffee? So, I think a big part of the point that she's trying to make has to do with the idea of what she calls borderlands. And you'll remember, maybe from last time, uh, we talked about liminal spaces, what these were. To hit you with some of you know, my particular professional jargon here. You've said that word, liminal. Very recently, yes. <laughs> yes. It's like, it's like what you limit yourself to be able to speak or something like that? Like, it, it's, it's not about limits. Although I can see where you might 
in-between. Yeah, liminal spaces are those in-between spaces, right? Yeah. That are neither, that are um, either, uh, they're both either or and neither nor, right? So, for, um, so what Anzaldo is interested in is the unique cultures that develop around borders, right? The way borders, which are themselves artificial boundaries, right? There's nothing particular, I mean, the political boundary mm -hmm. between um, the United States and Mexico is artificial, is man-made, right? Now, there are also natural barriers there. You know, there's a frickin' river um, and also several, you know, several hundred thousand miles of desert, right? Yeah. Um, but yeah, the borders are essentially artificial. And that the area around a border is conducive to hybridity, right? To the creation of these kinds of mixed cultures. So for example, you know, there are, there, are Chica there are Chicanos on either side of the Mexican, the Mexico-US border. And what matters so much is not which side of the border they're on, but the fact of the border and that they're clustered around it, right? And borders are really kind of everywhere in our lives, right? That, you know, borders aren't just these kind of official political borders, right? Um, you know, there are unique cultures that develop even like in the borders, but, you know, the kind of the traditional borders between regions, right? So the area around the Mason-Dixon line in the United States is different from any place else in the U.S. Um, you know, neighborhoods where there is a kind of blend of ethnic identities create a, a new, like a new amalgamated culture, right? Um, whereas cultures, uh, like places where there is a rigid separation um, between two particular groups on either side of the border, um, also develop a particular unique culture, but it's one that's often more based on kind of exclusion rather than inclusion, right? Um, now, where I want to go with this is what Anzaldua has to say about Chicano, Spanish and Chicano culture and its particular origins, right? Where it comes from. So let's look first at what she says about Chicano Spanish on page 39. Right, she says, due to geography, Chicanos from the Valley of South Texas were cut off linguistically from other Spanish speakers. We tend to use words that the Spaniards brought over from medieval Spain. The majority of the Spanish colonizers in Mexico and the Southwest came from Extremadura, Hernan Cortez was one of them, and Andalusia. Andalusians pronounce double L like a Y, and their Ds tend to be absorbed by adjacent vowels. Torado becomes Torayo. They brought el lenguaje popular, dialectos y regionalismos, right? So what's she pointing out here about Chicano Spanish and some of its features? Where does it come from? Spaniards. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it comes. Yeah, it comes from Spaniards from particular regions, right? Mm -hmm. So you can actually pinpoint it to particular regional tendencies in Spain, right? Mm -hmm. And what historical era does she connect it to? Yeah, yeah. So, so she's a, she's a. Specifically, medieval Spain, right? She's talking about 16th century. yeah, fifteenth, sixteenth century Spain, right? So the point she's trying to make here is that Chicano Spanish isn't a new development, right? You know, it's a hybrid development, but it's not an inferior form of Spanish that has just arisen, you know, in recent years, right? That actually is connected historically to older forms, right, and to older ideas than modern Spanish is. So it's not a corruption of Spanish, right? Now, she also talks a good bit 
about cultural hybridity on page 42. First, there's the bit about the movies that she went to see as a kid, right? Even before I read books by Chicanos or Mexicans, it was the Mexican movies I saw at the drive-in, the Thursday night special of a dollar a carload, that gave me a sense of belonging. Vamanos a las vistas, my mother would call out, and we'd all, grandmother, brother, sister, and cousins, squeeze into the car. We'd wolf down cheese and bologna white bread sandwiches while watching Pedro Infante and melodramatic tearjerkers like Nosotros los Pobres, the first real Mexican movie that was not an imitation of European movies. I remember seeing Cuando los hijos se van and surmising that all Mexican movies played up the love a mother has for her children and what ungrateful sons and daughters suffer when they are not devoted to their mothers. I remember the singing type westerns of Jorge Negrete and Miguel Eceves Mejia. When watching Mexican movies, I sent, felt a sense of homecoming as well as alienation. People who were to mount to something didn't go to Mexican movies, or bias, or tune their radios to bolero, racherito, or corrido music. So first thing to note there, right? They're watching Mexican movies, right? But what do we notice about some of the genres of these movies that they're watching? Is, is, there, any, is there any genre of movie they're watching that sounds familiar? Yeah, these singing type westerns. So you've got a singing cowboy riding across the desert, right? Which is pretty familiar as a mid 20th century American movie trope too, right? And what do they eat when they go to the movies? White bread, bologna and cheese sandwiches. Yeah, like, is there a more American sandwich than that? <laughs> oh my God. I'm not, I'm, I'm not a huge fan of it. it it's, it's better when you fry it. Yeah, um, or but, it's kind of gross. Um, yeah. But it's like, if you fry it and put it on, what is it, mashed potatoes with cheese on it, it's yeah, pretty good. I, yeah. <laughs> I, 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 I could see that, yeah. It's, it's, actually, it's also good, it's, it's good if you fr cut it up and fry it in scrambled eggs. Um, all right then, well. But then, like, uh, she continues on here, right, to talk about music. The whole time I was growing up, there was Norteño music, sometimes called North Mexican border music, or Tex-Mex music, or Chicano music, or Cantina bar music. I grew up listening to conjuntos, three or four piece bands made up of folk musicians playing guitar, bajo sexto, drums, and button accordion, which Chicanos had borrowed from the German immigrants who had come to central Texas and Mexico to farm and build breweries. In the Rio Grande Valley, Steve Jordan and Little Joe Hernandez were popular, and Flaco Jimenez was the accordion king. The rhythms of Tex-Mex music are those of the polka, also adapted from the Germans, who in turn had borrowed the polka from the Czechs and Bohemians. So what unexpected origin of Mexican music is she pointing out here? Yeah, that, yeah it, mo most of it actually comes from Central Europe, right? Not from Spain and not from indigenous Mexico at all. So she's pointing out there's more hybridity in just about any culture than most of us realize. Even the Germans get the polka rhythm from somebody else, right? I was going to say, I think she made a point you were like mentioning all this, like the doctor from Germany, uh -huh. the Czechs and like there's no real borders in between. Yeah. What, you know, what culture. Yeah, and, and art and ideas are always crossing borders, right? Mm -hmm. and, coming, and then coming back in a different form. Well, I mean, with America, with how we're supposed to be standard, uh -huh. we have so much diversity within America. So what really is America? Yeah, and I think that's a big part of what she's arguing here, right? It's like, who were these people to tell me that I'm not American or that my culture isn't American when all cultures are these hybrid amalgamations of all these different influences, right? And now... The last shot she takes here has to do with the genetic origins of most Chicano people, right? If we look on page 44, she says, as a culture, we call ourselves Spanish when referring to ourselves as a linguistic group and when copping out. It is then that we forget our predominant Indian genes we are 70 to 80% Indian. So genetically speaking, 
where do most Chicanos come from? Who are their ancestors? Oh, okay, is she speaking of Native American or Yes. Or <laughs> yes, Native American, American Indian. Yes, that's okay. what she means, yes. So they go from actually North American. Yeah. Yeah. So this raises the question then, right? You know, who's who's more authentically American, <laughs> right? Her and her people, or the descendants of European colonists who expect her to conform to a particular standard, right? So the whole essay is about complicating the linguistic and cultural ideas surrounding what it means to be an American, right? And that wild tongue the dentist is trying to control is best expressed here, I think, in the way she mixes English and Spanish throughout the essay, right? You know, she's, she's not going to conform to a particular language standard. She's going to grow up, she's gonna write in the Spanglish that she grew up speaking, because this is her authentic form of expression. In a footnote, uh -huh. I think I'm on the first page of like, all the reading, she, it, it says that um, at the author's request, all Spanish phrases in the text will be left untranslated, I think. Yeah, so absolutely more. intentional, yeah. She, there are a few phrases she provides a translation mm -hmm. for herself, right? But for the most part, yeah, they are left untranslated. Um, which means that, you know, if you don't speak Spanish and you want to know what they mean, you've got to go look them up, yeah. Which is what I had to do, but yeah. All right, so we started a little early. We are out of time now. Does anybody have any questions about anything before I let you go? Okay. I wrote this one down like in the margin. Okay. Yeah. When she was talking about her, her mom. Uh huh. Like, but it's on page 37. Yeah. It's at the bottom. Um, it says, Poncho, culture trader, you're speaking the oppressive language by speaking English. You're ruining this language. Spanish language that have been uh -huh. by various Latin, Latinos and like, Latinas. Okay, I was thinking that maybe she could get, like, get, get from both sides. Yeah. Like she does. And so, like, I don't know. Like, it's a struggle either way. Absolutely, yeah. Especially when speaking Spanish, as she says. Uh huh. Like, it's a struggle either way. Because yeah. Which one do I identify with? Do I just the standard Spanish or the, the standard English? Yeah, and remember, too, yeah, that Chicano used to be a slur. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it used, it used to be an insult. And I think that there's some kind of trace of that in what she's referring to there, right? Mm -hmm. um, as, yeah, her her particular identity and her language not being respected um, by other people of Latin American descent, yeah. Because there's, there's, their Spanish isn't pure. All right, so let's get everything shut down and get you on your way. And we'll see you on Tuesday to talk about Chinua Achebe. He's definitely, I'm now confident I was not.